Hi, I'm Dr. Carolyn Alexander. So nice to be here today. Happy Tuesday. My um, dear friend Jennifer Schulman will be joining in. Let's see. Thanks for doing this. I I love acupuncture and all all that all of you guys do. And so I thought this was an important topic. How have you been? I'm good. <laughs> Excited to <I'm>, be here. <laughs> yeah, so exciting. I know for me when I had um, was starting to try in my late thirties. I feel in my heart the thing that helped me the most was actually the acupuncture to lower my cortisol and stress and I'd love to hear your thoughts about that yeah so you know probably like the couple of the questions that patients will ask me the most usually the first time we talk on the phone or I see them in person in the offices how does acupuncture work for my eggs or for my uterus and then how does it affect me in other ways. And the other ways question ties in for what you're saying. And acupuncture resets the autonomic nervous system. So it gets you out of fight or flight and into a relaxed state. When you're in a relaxed state, you decrease stress hormones like cortisol. Also what happens is when you reset the autonomic nervous system, your body releases small amounts of GABA, serotonin, and dopamine. So you're already gonna feel better. And then when you're already in a more relaxed state, you tend to sleep better. And we know how important sleep and melatonin is for fertility as well. Yes, I notice when I take a detailed history, I feel like telemedicine has made my history taking even more detailed than when it was in person. But I ask a lot of patients if they're sleeping okay. And, and in, especially in women with PCOS, their ovulatory function isn't typical, especially if they have sleep disturbances. And I'd love to hear your thoughts about that too. In, in, in the sense of how patients sort of report changes with their sleep patterns? Yeah. Um, let's see. I would say the first time patients come in, I always kind of make this joke, like the first time you do acupuncture, you get the most high. And I don't always tell everybody that they'll sleep really well, but I would say maybe a third of my patients will text me the next morning and say, wow, that's the best sleep that I've had. And what happens is people have different types of sleep disturbances. Patients will have trouble falling asleep. They can't turn their mind off or there are patients who just can't even stay asleep through the night. And a lot of patients report waking between one and three in the morning. So Chinese medicine looks at that as a very much a liver chi stagnation we call. So on the circadian clock that falls into a liver category, which is emotional stress. And I think yeah. almost any woman going through this experience is going to be experiencing some level of emotional stress. Yeah, and I've seen the weighted blanket, like some of the patients, especially if they say they can't get into the deep sleep, I'll have them think about getting a weighted blanket. And even for myself, I'm always sort of thinking about patients and what the next day is going to be like and this and that. And with the weighted blanket, it's helped me tremendously with with that and and essential oils too, even though as a Western doctor, I think that's always interesting, but I, I like find it. putting some lavender here or, you know, here, it helps me get ready for sleep or makes my mind think, okay, now it's time for a sleepy time. Yeah. And when you're, when you're talking to patients about their sleep and the quality of their sleep, it's even beyond like, when are you waking up or are you having trouble, you know, falling asleep, sleep. Some women are reporting that they have night sweats or they wake up multiple times to urinate. And all of that is important in Western medicine and in Chinese medicine when making a real differential diagnosis with your patient. Like, 
are you waking up multiple times a night because maybe you have fibroids or are you waking up multiple times a night because you're staying up super late and drinking a ton of water and like you can have a lot of lifestyle mm -hmm. directions that go when you have the opportunity to take a longer intake which is maybe kind of as you're saying one of the benefits that's happened with more of the telemedicine yeah and that reminds me how important kegel exercises are in any any reproductive age woman how how that's really important and um and now that we're checking before embryo transfers for urea plasma and mycoplasma in the vagina because it may hinder the embryo's ability to implant and so we are catching a few more vaginal cultures that are not stds they happen to anybody but it's important to treat that and sometimes i notice if i catch a uti and the vaginal culture it'll be the same bacteria causing the same uh problem and if we can get that system in balance and the ph of the vagina in balance the embryo has a better chance to implant it's so interesting that you just brought this up because i just saw um, a new OBGYN last week emily sicking uh, on the west side and we had this really interesting conversation about vaginal flora and immunological factors and how stress affects your vagina and affects your ability to stay pH balanced and how important it is and how you know if you get a regular um, vaginal swab they don't always check for their, their microbacteria I think and I, I love that yeah and I, I think the other thing before an embryo transfer in in general is to not um, eat too many sugary foods, even though it's it's tempting for everybody. But for myself, having started really, I think later in reproductive age, I the three months before I started, I had really put a mindset that I wouldn't have any candy or sweets. And I joke that I was pretending I was preparing for the Olympics to get ready, like as if I was training and exercising and everything like that. Because normally I'm always working all day and, and grabbing whatever the nurses hand me or have at the nurse's station to eat. So it's, it's funny thinking back to that time. I did really put a lot of my mindset changed and, and changed my, my day to day habits. I really am glad that you brought up that you did that for three months prior because one of the things that when patients ask me, they're like, okay, I get that blood flow, increased blood flow helps with follicles, but sort of how and when and how often and when should I start? So acupuncture increases the uh, flow of blood to the follicles and the uterus, but not just the follicles that you're seeing when you come in for your baseline ultrasound. It's all the follicles that are on the outside that are being recruited over a period of three to six months, that whole oogenesis cycle. So the sooner you start taking your supplements, getting acupuncture, it pays dividends in the long run. So if you end up doing multiple retrievals and you start the acupuncture, just so you find out about it that that like week before you start your stimulation cycle, it'll help to some degree. But if you end up having to do several, you'll find that I find anecdotally speaking that sometimes my patients actually have a very good third retrieval. And I'm like, yes, those are the follicles I've been working with for months and I get excited. So it's yeah, that's, that makes sense. I think it's always this fine balance with the AMH, which is a reflection of egg supply, but FSH is a reflection of egg quality. And I, I find it doing this for 17 years that when the AMH is on the low side, if I've waited too long, sometimes the follicle count goes down and people wish they tried on a month that they might've had more, but we can't predict no. the month to month variability of what can recruit so each month you have a pool of eggs that can grow and we're obviously hoping to try to get quality and quantity eggs to pop up and with your help and with um, the patient taking vitamins and having that positive thinking breathing exercises i think that's been very helpful but i think it's hard when patients say oh do i have the next year yeah to me i feel like it should be but nature sometimes has a different plan, especially when we get into our 40s.
You know, and some, just as you were saying, like some months patients have quite a few follicles and then the next month they may not. And they'll say, why, why this month? What did I do? And sometimes that's just the nature of how you ended up being recruited that month. And you may not have done anything. And like, I think sometimes too, women put so much pressure and guilt on themselves and it's a horrible burden to bear going into this. So as much as like I try and I know you try to be emotionally supportive, like you're doing the best that you can. Yeah. And that's why I say we can't look to the past because one of my patients was telling me on and on about her college days and sorority and things she was doing and how she has this overwhelming guilt about it. And I told her the past of the past, you can't look back because all we can do is, is look forward and think, what can I do next to optimize the health of the eggs? I've helped patients into their fifties and we, we work really hard to get them a healthy full-term baby. And I think it's, it's important to understand that. Yeah. Yeah. So what else does, um, do you touch on when you're talking to patients? So they'll, besides talking about the increased blood flow, decreasing stress, I, I would say the things that I end up most helping people with will be, some medication side effects like headaches or night sweats, again, that can come into play. Uh, also post-retrieval, sometimes bloating and constipation, actually even right before a retrieval, I'll, I'll be like, have you had a bowel movement in the last few days? And then they'll kind of begrudgingly be like, actually, I haven't. And the reality is if you help a patient have a bowel movement, they end up feeling physically a lot better. And we yeah. you know, don't like to talk about that in regular society, but it's important part of your overall health. Your digestive health is a huge part. Yeah. I, I noticed too with magnesium that helps a lot of patients. And then after the retrieval, taking milk of magnesia or Miralax too, or any fiber rich, you know, foods. And the other thing about avoiding constipation is that, it also helps you flush out toxins, like you're saying, and, and that's important. Two tricks with the headaches that we use is sometimes I'll tell patients to use a bandana on their head, too. That'll kind of help the tension or musculoskeletal type of headache because we're trying to avoid aspirin before the retrieval. And sometimes patients take an aspirin, but it's not ideal the week before your egg retrieval to take, especially an Excedrin or anything like that. We also don't really want you to take Advil or Motrin that week necessarily too. So Tylenol, or we can give a prescription called Reglan that helps as well. I, I think all the patients are really good so far that I see. Nobody sneaks. We're just like, I don't want to take anything. Can you help me? And I'll be like, I got you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, that I feel like gets talked about more and more. And I think a lot of my colleagues um, can report this is, because we have the space because we're in there doing a little intake before we put the needles in and then we have a period of time we're with the patient putting the needles in is checking in on the emotional health of the patient where you're at giving them to grace the grace to be sort of i have lots of feelings right now and i'm yelling at my partner and letting them know that it's okay and this too shall pass and even just check yeah. with how the experience is with work and there I mean, maybe they already have children at home and just being this platform or sort of a you know a sounding board for needing to talk about this experience that can be very private for a lot of people and maybe they don't tell their friends or their parents or their employer yeah i noticed that i tend to ask who's your support system really lean on them feel comfortable to express those feelings and i um, sometimes just make a joke, don't send emails in all caps by accident, because, you know, <laughs> it's just that feeling you'll have highs and lows. And some people want to clean their closet, reorganize and color everything. And other people really feel a bit fatigued from the injections during the process. Imagine instead of ovulating the one egg for the month, we're trying to help you ovulate a lot of eggs. So it's also needs proper nutrition more frequent meals and water from non-BPA plastic is important as well. Yeah, I agree. The water, you know, it's so funny. Nobody really ever asked me about water, so I'm glad you brought that up. I'll bring that up more. I 
sort of, it, it doesn't come up as often as I would think it would. Yeah, when I, when I was trying, I would always have all these empty Perrier bottles with filtered water in it, and I would just use glass, or the BPA plastic is also wonderful, too, Yeah, as well. Um, yeah. Any other tips for egg quality that you have noticed? Egg quality. I actually was just taking a class about this on Friday night, because that's what I do on a Friday night. It was... <laughs> A lot of the question, uh, what the lecturer was talking about is not about acupuncture specifically, but more of you know, controversial in sort of the integrated medicine world about the use of Chinese herbs. And so the emphasis is you cannot change the chromosomal integrity of an egg, but that they can actually show that some um, herbs that are used increase HP and increase mitochondria. And that is, you know, very interesting conversation to, to have with the patient. If that's something, you know, depending on the timeline of how long working with the patient before, you know, they're, they're in a stimulation cycle or you know, everybody's on a different fertility journey with a different timeline. It's interesting that you say that because I was reading an article that women in their 40s have a lot of mitochondria in their eggs, but they're not like functioning. So that's why maybe they fertilize but the blastocyst formation rate isn't as high to get the energy to get to a blastocyst which is the egg has to go from one cell to a fertilized egg which is two cells all the way to 100 cells which is a big step in embryogenesis and that takes a lot of energy from the yeah. egg yeah. and only maternal mitochondria go to our children the sperm provides the dna which is really important and the sperm has also the momentum from day three to day five. And so we here, we are really good at echoing to the guy to eat healthier. If he's overweight, I usually have a talk with him about his BMI. But it's really important to understand, too, that half the battle is the sperm as well. I, I, I think even now, even everything I read talks, it sounds so much more equitable with, you know, it's, it is what is it, 40% man, 40% woman, 20% unknown, or some sort of plus or minus five on that. Yet I still always feel like in casual conversation, it's always, well, she has to do everything and he doesn't. So I think just to continue to have the conversation about how your partner right. can support you and make health you know, conscious choices and, and supplement as well, I think it's, it's important. Important, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a good way to a uh, segue. We'd love to do this more frequently. And um, it's a joy to have you here today. And I wish everybody a healthy, happy journey in their in their fertility world of whatever they're doing. And we're here at SCRC at Southern California Reproductive Center in Los Angeles. And we put a lot of heart in our in our job to get good eggs and healthy embryos. So Anything you need, feel free to reach out to us. Take care. Bye. Bye.